We're swiftly approaching the cross, as we have been through the book of Matthew. Um, the intensity is increasing. So we'll start in Matthew 26. I say the intensity because this is, this is the last, we're in that narrative of the last week, right? This is the last eight chapters. So much is going on. Impossible for me to cover on, on just a few Sundays. So we'll be in Matthew 26. If you'll turn there, Lord, help me. I need you, Lord. We're going to hone in on verses 6 through 13, but I'll, I'll read the other verses before and after for context. Starting in verse 20, uh, chapter 26. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders and the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Verse 1 closes out the fifth discourse. That's the block of teaching in Matthew, uh, meaning the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. We're, he's talking to a Jewish audience, remember. So the last teaching, the Olivet Discourse, spoke of the second coming. And I'll give you the cliff notes this morning. Here's the cliff notes. It's harder to look at everybody when I'm down here. I might, I might have to go back up. I'm trying. Um, here's the cliff notes for the, the past two chapters, the past discourse. Jesus is coming at any moment. Get ready, be ready, and stay ready. There's your cliff notes. You got it? So that's what you need to know. The religious elites did not accept these things and the disciples did not fully understand what was going on. Still, even after all, all they've seen. In fact, when they heard him say the words Passover and Son of Man, what would they be thinking in that point if we're thinking in the Jewish context? They're thinking Passover, deliverance. Son of Man, the Messiah is coming to set up his earthly reign. That's what they are thinking. Every Passover, the Jews set an extra cup on the table for Elijah, looking for him to come, because if he comes in the door and sits down, the Messiah is coming. And this, this is going to happen, the kingdom. Meaning what? What? meaning the earthly reign where Jesus is in power setting up a, a, a government, an establishment, and driving out everyone who's not Jewish. And we're talking about slaughtering in that sense too. So when they heard Passover, son of man, and then crucified, no, this can't be happening. It would have been unacceptable because how could a mighty king be crucified? How could the Messiah be crucified? He's not supposed to be crucified. He's not supposed to die. Remember, that is the perspective that they saw. It is not the crucifixion the way we see it. Of course, we know it's salvation now, but that was not what was going through the thought process. It was the most degrading, demeaning way to die. Criminal's death by the Romans. So there's no way that this could be the Messiah. Because the Messiah didn't belong on a cross. No way. In their mind, the Messiah belongs in a, in a palace, in a, a mansion, a, a, a kingdom, something manifest of the kingdom. 
It would have to be somewhere where he could rule, a wealthy place. And ironically, it's in a palace. It's in a wealthy home, Caiaphas's home, that looks something like this. I don't know if it's exactly, but pretty close. It would be a little more beautiful than that on the outside. This is where they plotted to kill Jesus. This is where they plotted to kill the Messiah. They're secret about it because it, it was a violation of Jewish law to plan to execute somebody before they are convicted. It was against Jewish law. That's a good law that we need to think about, right? How many times do we execute someone in our minds before they're even convicted? Well, that's what, re that's what religiosity does, right? Basically, it does that. So they try to trap him in his words. They try to silence him. If you look through the, the whole, just Matthew, just Matthew, especially. So they're doing what the kingdom of the world, the kingdom that's clashing with this heavenly kingdom is doing, and that is fighting for position, fighting for power, and will use anything, especially violence, to do it. They had to use violence to protect their power. So it's from that scene that we cut back to verse 6. And I, I'm saying back to you, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she's done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So Matthew, the author, places this here for effect to contrast where we just were and also what's written after this. It's like a sandwich. This is a parallel of the anointing in Mark and John. The problem is in the, in the time that we live in with doctrine and theology and looking stuff, stuff up on the internet, a lot of these things that you ask will be answered wrong and you'll take it as truth, which I, I believe is something according to the last days we're living in, when truth becomes continually skewed. Uh, GotQuestions.org. Don't, don't trust that site for everything, trust me. I mean, you, you have to understand, some things are from certain denominational agendas, and it's not necessarily like false doctrine leading you to hell, but it's not going to be accurate. We have to study it. So this is a parallel of the anointing of, of, uh, in Mark and John. John, we get a little more detail, and his is the most chronological, going in order. So here we are st still this morning. In, in verse 6, we are still before the triumphal entry. Now, it's going to mess with some of your minds this morning, but it's, it's just a reality. Let's read in John uh, 12. Chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And it, it goes on from there. So there's another anointing in the, in, the, in the book of Luke, too. That's in Galilee. That's not even here. This one is different. And that's because the Bible, even as a whole, isn't chronological. That's why you have a chronological study Bible. Even Genesis, I mean, messes with people, right? You, have, you don't have two creations, but you have two accounts. Uh, Revelation, we're learning that on our Wednesday nights. But not every book is for that matter. 
everything in order. Are, are you tracking with me this morning? For a modern Western reader, especially us, that gets frustrating. Because we think somehow if it's not in order, then it must not be true. This doesn't take away from the authenticity of Scripture at all. This is how they wrote. They captured specific scenes or ideas that came to mind regardless of where they fell in the timeline of the story. And that is a literary thing. That's a device. It's a tool. Nonlinear storytelling to create suspense, to engage our interest, and bring out certain themes. It gives complexity and depth. And here in Matthew, he's doing this for a specific reason. So when Jesus was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, and there's that contrast, right? Look where we are now. Look at the scene that we're in now. Simon the leper, we don't know much about him, except he was a leper. Probably, I mean, healed by Jesus. So if that's the case, then this house would have been condemned at some point. So from a wealthy palace where their try, evil is trying to kill the Messiah, the next contrast is a leper's home. Where evil is being defeated, beginning to be, continuing to be defeated based on what's going on. One kingdom is about prestige, power, pol political power, control, and the other kingdom is about humility, hanging out with outcasts, and the least of these, and self-sacrifice. And that's where we find the Messiah. And a woman came. A woman came to Jesus. And the reason I say it like that is I'm trying to say it from the patriarchal feeling of, of what women were at that time. Women were not seen as equals to men. They were seen as less than. Women and children were seen, seen, I mean, less than. But women are just as, poor, as important to Jesus in this kingdom. Just as equal. Actually, that's how I already created it. So Matthew leaves her name off. You'll find her name in, in the other ones, of course. We know it's Mary. Um, Sister of Lazarus, Mary. But that's because her name isn't the point in Matthew. She has an alabaster flask. Details, there's less de de details here, and that's for a reason. We know it was expensive. If, if, we, if, we, if we weren't just reading Matthew, we'd find out that it, it's really expensive, like a year's salary. But still... Where we're reading, this is not what is important. So she pours it out. The disciples are freaking out. Why would you waste that? We could have sold it to the, given to the poor for the price. And you find out, in, you find out that, that amongst those voices was Judas, of course, ironically. But just think about their issues for questioning, first of all. If I'm sitting in a house with my leader, the Messiah, <coughs> I would be thinking, hey, if Jesus had an issue, let him say something. I mean, if he has an issue with what she's doing, he's going to say something. I'm not going to step up. I mean, it's like I'm correcting him. It's pretty presumptuous to even say anything. As if Jesus wouldn't know that what she's doing is wrong if it was wrong. So Jesus said, why do you trouble the woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. You always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. And pouring out this ointment on, on my body, she's done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. 
So they still didn't get it. It's not about the poor. It's not about the poor. And, the, and you can't use this verse to say that, well, well, we're always going to have the poor. We need to, um, people use it for that. That's wrong. Of course you're supposed to take care of the poor. He's been talking about it for many, many teachings before this. Key word is, you will, key phrase is, you will not always have me. Because they still did not understand or accept that he was going to die. It was unthinkable, even though he said it already. Like, this is the fourth time, I think, I'm going to be crucified. The Son of Man. But an unnamed, in this account, an unnamed woman gets it. She knew he was special. Right? We're talking about Mary. Of course she did. And there's where you can learn from the other accounts, right? Luke 10, 39, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. While her sister was busy with other things, but still, if we didn't know that, and we're reading Matthew alone, it's not about her. It's not about the fame. It's about Jesus and where he is going. This is what Matthew is trying to highlight here. Sandwiched in between Two different kingdoms. The anointing is about the cross. That's what the anointing is about. The anointing is about his worth. Not the unnamed woman's worth. Not anybody else's worth. Not even the, the expense of the bottle's worth. In Jewish tradition, kings and priests, other important people were anointed for service. But she's anointing him for burial, whether she knew it or not. She's anointing him for burial. Because he just said it. But still, uh, burial? Maybe he means something. He's got to mean something else. The Messiah can't be, surely not. I mean, you've, we followed you this far. You're just going to die? So now we go to another scene. Then one of the twelve, verse 14, then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he saw an opportunity to betray him. So what will you give me? And we see the corruption in Judas's heart, obviously influenced by Satan. For the price of a slave, according to Moses, and it's, it was a shameful amount. And this morning isn't about that. It's not about, it's, it's not about uh, the extras, right? It could have been $20, a couple hundred dollars. It, it, does it really matter? We're talking about betraying Jesus. So Judas was operating in a kingdom that works through betrayal and is in search of personal gain. To the elite in the palaces, Jesus was worth killing because their status and their influence was worth more than he was. Their position, how about, let's make it a little more relatable, our need to feel accepted or approved our need to fit in, our need to have influence. Even the disciples, their priorities were off, were off because their focus, well, yeah, give it to the poor. We could be doing really good things with that because we're about doing good things. And that, with money, right, you, have, you should use that for the kingdom. And, and that reminds me of the things that we argue about in churches, really, like, like a little church. Well, th you, you should be doing that with that money, and you should be doing this. And we, we, we get so caught up in this, we miss the point of why we're here today. This is why we're here. So the woman, she, Mary, she listened. I, I have to say the woman, because I want to stay in this account. The unnamed woman, she, she listened to his words, 
She spent time at, at his feet. And, and the thing that was remembered, the thing that she did, what she did was told in memory of her. But the reason that was told is because what she was doing pointed to the cross. What she was doing was preparing him for burial. A woman in a leper's house pouring out expensive perfume. Yes, a year's salary. If you need that fact to associate how expensive it was, because I think that would be hard for anyone. And uh, Kim, you could come out and start passing those out. A woman in a leper's house poured out expensive perfume to anoint the one who poured out the greatest expense, priceless, his own blood for us. Enough to pay for the penalty of all of our sin. The murderers from, from the elite, which, it's think about this, okay? The chief priests... And the religious elite, these guys in the palace, they were believers in God. They were religious. And then Judas, at this point, he's called one of the 12. This is a follower of Jesus at that time. The disciples, not able to see it until after the cross, because, you know, they all fall away. And we're going to see that before it's done. And I'm pretty sure we're making these same mistakes today. In a time where many are falling away, guess what? That time when many are falling away, it's been happening. It's been happening probably since Judas. If you want to use that time frame. And that's because we forget what the kingdom is about. Jesus taught us about it over and over again. And we don't just have one gospel. We have, we have four, and then we have the whole New Testament. And in our distractions, that was a distracting, distracting place in, in that leper's home, that's for sure. In our idealism, which means idealism is until things are this way, this perfect way that I see is, is, is good, I am going to complain about it or I'm going to not be satisfied. Having to have it our way or our fallen priorities because we get our priorities out of whack, of course. We forget. And we can, we can sit at his feet anytime and hear his words. Anytime. We have full access we have the access that, well, they didn't really have. I mean, they have physically there, but th what, what, what we have now is, is powerful, and we forget that. So we can sit at his feet and hear his words, read his words, study his words, if he is worth it. And he's worth it if we look at the cross again. What is he worth to us? What is he worth to us this morning? What are we doing? Like, why do we do what we do? Why are we doing what we're doing? What's the heart of it? Why are we here? I mean, I mean, Brother John said it in a, in a more old school way than I will, but what is, what is our hearts in this? Why do we come to church? It's the why, it's the motive in all that we're doing that points to his worth. How we live points to the cross. The cross is the victory that they could not see. For us, it's the victory that we see. We understand. We know it's true. We know it's real. Yeah, thanks. We're not going to drink this. Don't worry. 
you're not in a place with Kool-Aid. You never know. I mean, I could have just gone off the deep end over the weekend. No. They, they, they didn't understand the cross at that time until after. And in pointing to his death with that flask, which looked nothing like this, by the way. Okay, it was alabaster. I filled these last night. I made a mess all over the table. And there is real uh, spike dart in here, except I diluted it with a carrier oil, which I didn't know what it was until I, I had to research it because it was too expensive, really. I'm sorry. I couldn't do that. But I, I, I did this, and it's not about me pouring it. It wasn't that big of a sacrifice. I have to clean up when I get home. But in, in pointing to his death with that flask, whether she knew it or not, Mary was pointing, she was pointing to what was about to happen, victory over Satan and death. I, I, I said it in the Sunday school today, uh, oh, Colossians 2.15. Okay, yeah. Uh, because of what happened on the cross, there was a disarming of, of, of principalities and powers. So if you're running around thinking that Satan is constantly defeating you, you just have to get more aware of the kingdom that you are operating in now. The price is paid, and the price he paid is worth more than anything. It's worth more than our lives. It's worth more than our lives. And if that's the case, we will gladly lay down our lives for him. And isn't that what he taught us in uh, uh, Matthew 16, 4? He told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What's interesting to me is that the unnamed woman gets it before the male disciples. How's that for irony? She pours out a year's salary in a few moments. It's nothing to her. Because pointing to Jesus was most valued. There was something about him. There was something she paid attention to while they were all arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Plus, I mean, he, he, did, he did raise her brother from the dead. But we're still here to point to him. That's what we're here to do, to point people to the price that was paid for all it's worth, which is everything. If he did not die, he couldn't raise from the dead. If he didn't raise from the dead, we're without hope. And his kingdom still advances by people who are willing to die and suffer sandwiched in between worlds of palaces and powers and distractions and people who are betraying and obsessed about money and, and inflation and all these things. In the midst of all that, all Jesus wants is people who will sit at his feet and pay attention and and. By doing that, by that devotion, point to the very person, the very God that he is. Or do we ask, what's in it for me? You know, desperate people don't really, really desperate people It's who are just trying to stay, like, alive, right? It's not really what they're getting. It's like, I just, whatever, any, just something, you know, just breakthrough. I just need a moment of peace. But the what's in it for me mentality, which it's prevalent now. I'm witnessing it right now, and my heart is just, my, my heart is so torn. Like, I, I'm grieving this morning, literally. And it's because we're operating in the wrong kingdom. It's all about how will this, whatever I'm doing in my life, you could call it, you could relate it to pouring out oil, but how is this pointing to Jesus? How is how I treat my kids pointing to Jesus? How is how I love my wife pointing to Jesus? How is how, is how I love the, the, the drug addicts, the mentally ill, the, the, or the people who've hurt me? How is that pointing to Jesus? Maybe how I pray for them, because I get it. You can't, you can't do it all, right? Because it's about doing. No. How, how, is, how I'm praying for them pointing to Jesus? What will my memorial be? What will your memorial be? 
if it's something that's poured out, well, that, that, that brings me to Paul. And I'm closing with this, Philippians 2.17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. 2 Timothy 4.6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He kept trusting in God till the end. He kept trusting in God in prison, being persecuted with and without, naked, hungry, shipwrecked. It didn't matter. He trusted in God, uh, having stage four cancer in a wheelchair. He trusted in God, not having a home because you're living in a residential facility. He trusted in God, um, having whatever issues you're having today. He or she, right? So just pour it out, whatever it is, for the one who poured it out for all of us. And remember what that oil points to. You have to remember the cross. You have to listen to his words. Not from Google, not just from Sunday morning, but actually being in his word. Take time at his feet. The thing that no one has anymore, it's time. And you can take time and your memorial will be like Mary's and all who proclaim the gospel by their lives because this is really an evangelism verse, guys. You see the gospel right there. It right there. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, that's for a reason also. It's what that was pointing to, leading people to Jesus. Because that's the only way that anybody's going to be, have any hope. By leading to Jesus' death, resurrection, and eternal life. That's what we have to be doing with our lives. So <laughs> if we're not doing anything weird with these bottles, just, just, just take it. Just take it and just, if it even helps you remember in the weeks come by, like, what am I doing to point to Jesus? You know, what, what, what is this all about? What's, whatever it is, you have to lay it down even to the point of laying down your life. Because people need to know about this cross. They need to know about the price that was paid. We have to return to that. And there's something it's going to cost you. It's going to be a great cost. For some of you, you may even lose family members and friends. It stinks. For some of you, people may, like, <laughs> abandon you. For some of you, they may say things about you behind your back. For some of you, they may... Uh, hate you forever or crucify you. And who does that sound like? Well, that sounds like exactly what happened to Jesus. He poured it out. Everything he could. For us, they fell away from him. He was betrayed. Just to give us the opportunity. Let's pray this morning. Father, We look to the cross. We're not looking to a place that you're going to, Lord. We're looking to a place that you've already been. It's a price you've already paid. We can't even imagine the cost. The word expensive can't even contain it, Lord. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to be a people who point others to you. Not to our version of Christianity that seems best. Not to a bunch of works that make us feel better about ourselves. But to a place where we are helpless and all we can do is trust in the one who became helpless for us on a cross. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We look to you and we point to you this morning with our lives. Lord, bless everyone as they leave here in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Have a good day. Thank you.